This is Ilse Strauss coming to you from the Bridges for Peace headquarters here in Jerusalem, the city of the great king and the most beautiful city in the whole wide world, I am sure you will agree. Now, over the past two weeks, all eyes have been on the north of Israel and southern Lebanon, where Israel launched probably one of the most targeted and most strategic strategies in modern history warfare. It started on the 17th of September when thousands of pagers, thousands of walkie-talkies started blowing up in the hands of Hezbollah terrorists. And it culminated this Friday evening with a targeted killing of Secretary General of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah. Now, one thing that I do want you to keep in mind is that this was not about death. This is not about celebrating death, not at all. This is about preserving life. And here with us today to unpack this strategy is Major in the Reserves, political and um, a military analyst, Elliot Hordoff. Elliot, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Elliot, before we jump right in, please tell us who you are. Why should we listen to you? Why should we take your word for this? Well, first of all, I've been an, uh, an officer, regular and reserve in the IDF since 1985. I still serve. Uh, my most recent service was for a month in the South, in the Gaza Division, in October and November of this past year. And uh, I still do consulting work in, in Israel. You know, civilian and military is is sort of two sides of the same coin. Um, and so I, I do a lot of work there as well. I'm also, I do... I work with uh, the American system, uh, with law enforcement, um, and so on. I'm an analyst. Uh, I've been studying terrorist organizations for about 50 years now. And my particular expertise, simply because it's the neighborhood, are Hamas and, and Hezbollah, uh, both of whom I've not only studied academically, but I've also had to deal with them physically, uh, both in Gaza and in Lebanon. So the background is is academic, it's theoretical and practical at the same time. Uh, and I don't know who listens to me, but who hears me uh, are political and military leaders, as I said, particularly in Israel and the United States, but also in, in some other countries as well. Now, Elliot, you are not only a soldier or an analyst. You, this is also very personal to you. You live up north. You are yes, a father. Tell us a little bit about that from a more personal. Uh, yes, I, I live up north in the Galilee, um, not very close to the Lebanese border. Of course, in Israel, close and very close are all relative terms. It's not that big a country. Uh, the last thirty-six hours, we were. Uh, we had five alerts. We were in, in the safe room as explosions were going on overhead. Um, as you said, I'm I'm a father, actually, a, a, the father of a four-and-a-half-year-old now. My my older kids are, are older, older. Uh, and we're having to deal with what it means for him to be in a room with, with things going boom overhead uh, and making sure that we get there in, in time and safely and that sort of thing. So Yes, it's professional, it's military, and very much part of part of our, our daily civilian lives. Um, fragments fell in our community yesterday. Fortunately, nobody was injured. Uh, a couple of cars were bad, badly damaged, so if people had been outside, they, they could have been injured and killed. It's Yes, it's really that close uh, for us. So we're not evacuated, we're not in that, that narrow belt along the border of evacuees, but uh, but close enough that we see it and hear it often enough. Now, Elliot, I do want to focus on the past two weeks and this strategy that Israel implemented. But first, I want to put it into context. And I know that if we have to put it into the correct context, we're going to go back decades. We don't really have time for this. But can you can you just share with us a little bit about who is Hezbollah? Where are they? Uh, what do they want? And how are they different from Hamas, and 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 who do they answer to? Okay, there are many similarities and some critical differences. The and and we do have to go back decades. But we don't have to. We don't have to spend a lot of time there. Sure. Uh, they are both outgrowths of the Muslim Brotherhood. 
their ideology both come out of the Muslim Brotherhood. But Hezbollah takes it from Ayatollah Khomeini, who was also a follower of the Brotherhood, but as a Shiite leader, took it in a slightly different direction. But what's key to both of them is that the ideology of the Brotherhood vis-a-vis -vis Israel and Jews, by the way, it's not just about Israel, is that Israel needs to be eradicated and Jews need to be annihilated. Okay. This is, uh, if it sounds Nazi, it's because they drew it directly from the Nazis of the 1930s. And uh, one of the books that I have up here behind me is Ayatollah Khomeini's key work called Islamic Government, a book that should be widely read in the West, but it's not. I have read it. On paragraph two of page one, it says the Jews have always been the enemies of Islam. In other words, this is. This is a very clear uh, message. It's not about Zionists, and it's not about occupation, and it's not about policies. The Jews are the enemy. And the extension of that, and he goes into it in other places, is they need to be eradicated. Hassan Nasrallah, who we, we took out, and by the way, I don't like to use the word assassination, because Nasrallah was not a political leader who was, who was assassinated. He was the, the head of a terrorist, violent organization, and he was eliminated. Uh, but he, a few years ago, made a public statement saying, we support the idea for all Jews to move to Israel. And if that seems to be an eyebrow raiser, he explained why. He said, because then it will make it easier to kill them all. We will not have to search them out all around the world. So that's who we're dealing with. And, and I think it's important to understand, especially the way uh, this conflict is covered, that uh, sort of tit for tat, well, the, you know, Hezbollah did it because Israel did it, and Israel did it because Hezbollah did it, and the the, the infamous um, Sky News commentary a, a couple of weeks ago that um, Israel has now provoked Hezbollah. Well, you know what? When somebody wants to murder you, you're not exactly pro provoking them anymore. Uh, so I'm confused because didn't Hezbollah go to war against Israel on the 8th of October? Yes. Did, did, did anybody forget okay. about that? So here, let me also be a little more precise. Hezbollah went to war with Israel in the early 1980s when it came into existence. And what we've had since then are varying campaigns and battles. And by the way, the same is true with Hamas, uh, who came into existence in the late 1980s. The war with Israel is constant. It will end for them when Israel is destroyed. So when people say incorrectly, uh, we need to end the war, meaning what they really mean is we need to stop the Israeli offensive, which is holding off these murderous groups from continuing to do what they've been planning to do ever since they came into existence. Uh, the war doesn't end when we stop shooting. The war for them ends when we stop breathing. Wow. Wow. And this is something that the West really doesn't understand. No, that, no. That Astoundingly, the leadership doesn't understand. I mean, the rank and file, okay, you know, it's not, it's not your job, so to speak. But the leadership, when uh, Secretary of State Blinken says, well, you know, it's really just about making some uh, territorial exchanges along the border, it's like, do you not listen to these people? Do you not read what, they, what they've written? Uh, it, and you're clear about it. By the way, here I have to say, with all due, you know, disrespect for for their their horrendous ideology, they're honest. They're upfront about it. When right. you know, when the when the supreme leader of Iran says Israel is a cancer that needs to be removed, it's kind of hard not to figure out what he means. Oh my goodness. Okay, so Elliot, let's take it from the 8th of October. What is the context? Okay. If we speak about, okay. oh, this tit for tat, Israel did this, so Hezbollah did this, where did this round start? Okay, so this round started on, on October 7th with the Hamas attack. Uh, 6,000, as it turns out, we've, we've done better arithmetic over intelligence uh, over the past couple of months, 6,000 terrorists and hangers-on crossed from Gaza into southern Israel, murdering, raping, kidnapping, mutilating, uh, snatching bodies. I mean, 
the the list is is so horrendous. It, it's a horror movie. Um, and Hezbollah apparently, I say apparently based on very very good evidence, but I but not absolutely conclusive. So I'm going to leave a little bit of a perhaps in there. But apparently, the plan was for Hezbollah to join in. And here I have to say that um, what happened on October 7th was something that we feared mostly from Hezbollah more than Hamas. And here I have to say, I served for nearly a decade um, and I'm, since 2010 in the command center of Northern Command of the IDF. So I'm not going to give away any classified information, but this is from the inside. And our concern was that Hezbollah would come across the border. They have a an assault force called Red One, whose purpose is, its express mission is to cross the border into northern Israel and do essentially what Hamas did on October 7th. And why didn't they? What happened? Okay, so Hamas, for its own security reasons, correctly, didn't tell anybody what the date was going to be. In other words, they had a tacit agreement with Hassan Nasrallah that he was going to come in, but they didn't tell him when. So by the time Nasrallah understood what was going on, the seventh was going was happening. And here again, my estimate is that what he was planning to do was wait until around the 10th, because according to the Hamas plan, they were going to put their five, 6,000 terrorists into Israel, grab a whole bunch of locations, municipalities. We know they plan to go much further than they actually got, and to hold them for an extended period of time. They, they, they brought equipment, supplies, provisions for a month. Okay, so their, their plan, their dream, was for there to be an ongoing battle going on in southern Israel for a month was their their high-end estimate. And they were counting on a number of things. One was uh, there was a great deal of political unrest in Israel at the time. The country was divided over uh, the judicial reform. I don't want to go into that, but in fact, the country was divided. Uh, some of the protesters had said they were not going to serve in the reserves anymore. They were going to refuse service. Uh, there were huge demonstrations going on. And here, I have to just, just say as an aside, this is a common error made by totalitarian regimes and organizations. What we know makes a democracy strong looks like weakness to them. Okay, 100,000 demonstrators looks like weakness. What I say is that if 100,000 demonstrators go out and demonstrate against the government and they all go home at the end of the day, that shows the strength of the system. Indeed. They see that as weakness. So all of that, I mean, there were more, but I think you get the picture that they have this image of what's going to happen. And in addition to that, a model of what happened the last time around in 2006, which was what we call the Second Lebanon War with Hezbollah, most people either don't know or don't remember that the event that started it, the precursor to it, was the capture of Gilad Shalit by Hamas. And what happened there is that he was taken to Gaza. The IDF began an operation in Gaza against Hamas. Hezbollah launched its attack across the border. The IDF stopped the operation in Gaza and moved up north. In other words, it, it couldn't deal with the two, two at once, primarily because the chief of staff at the time decided not to mobilize reserves. Okay, so, so that's their picture. That's the image. They want to run that version 2.0 in, in 2023. Much to all of their surprise, a few things happened that, that shocked them immediately. First of all, the Israeli military, not so much from the top, but from the bottom, gets attacked together very, very quickly. In other words, units in the field, um, reservists who aren't called up, begin moving. Here again, a long story in and of itself. But basically, within hours, there are forces responding that didn't get orders to respond. And the system catches up with them. In other words, even the upper echelons, by mid-afternoon on the 7th, the, the attack began at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, by mid-afternoon, the system is is on track 
And the result is physically on the ground that by Sunday morning, in other words, 24 hours after it starts, it's over. There are a few individual terrorists still running around here and there on that morning, but 6,000 terrorists have been either captured or killed or have fled back to Gaza with hostages, with or without hostages. In other words, the event is over in 24 hours that they expected to take 30 days. Second, the government on the morning of the 7th declares this is a war. Now, that's significant. It has, it has legal ramifications, it has social ramifications, it has economic ramifications, and it's not something that's done lightly. Uh, just here again to give you an idea, the, 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 the war in 2006 was fought in July and August of 06. The government declared it a war retrospectively in March 2007. Thank goodness. Okay, and that had to do with, with rehabilitation and insurance and all sorts of things like that. In other words, it was long over before the system said, oh, that was a war. Here, within hours, the system said, we're at war, and almost immediately did two more things, and this had an immediate impact on, on Hezbollah. One is mobilized the largest reserve call-up ever in Israel's history. Nearly 400,000 reservists were mobilized. The demonstration leaders immediately got up and said, demonstrations are over. Anybody gets called up, goes. And a good number of those reservists, and it was, and it was done very quickly, it was the fastest reservist call up ever in Israeli history. So within a couple of days, there are now 200,000 troops on the northern border that weren't there on the morning of the 7th. Uh -huh. Okay, now I'm leaving what happened in the south. That's, a, again, it's its own story. We're talking about Hezbollah. On the 8th, it was also decided to evacuate nearly 100,000 Israelis from the northern border to prevent that Red Dwan force that I mentioned earlier from doing on the 9th or the 10th what Hamas did on the 7th. So suddenly, by October 8th, 9th, Hassan Nasrallah is looking across a border that looks very, very different from the way it did on the morning of the 7th. At the same time, the Israeli Air Force began bombarding Hamas positions in Gaza. Uh, artillery was moved in, started striking Hamas positions in Gaza. And Nasrallah, I, I can only guess the paraphrase of the words, is sitting there saying, you know what, maybe this wasn't such a good idea to begin with. <laughs> and that whole plan basically goes out the window. What he ah. does instead <laughs> is start launching rockets, knowing full well that once Israel mobilizes to go into Gaza, we're not by choice going to fight a two-front war. We'll do it if we have to. But we had five divisions engaged in Gaza, and our, the, our key assault divisions, and they can't be in two places at once. The combat support, primarily air and artillery, was dedicated heavily to Gaza. It also can't be in two places at once. It can be divided, but not not be fully there. Excuse me. So he, for months, basically plays a tit-for-tat game with Israel, firing rockets, anti-tank missiles, drones, first into the evacuated northern communities, causing huge destruction, by the way. And then over the past few months, escalating, uh, I think in part as Israel crushed Hamas, and we're still in the process of destroying them, but we've essentially crushed them. He started stepping up because whatever relief he could bring would be, I'm talking about Nasrallah, would be to the benefit. And at the same time, along the way, uh, we were striking key targets, not a lot of them. In other words, here again, it was it was precision, it was pinpoint, uh, taking out Fuad Shukr, who was the number two in Hezbollah, a number of months ago, uh, and at the same time, Ismail Haniyeh, the head of Hamas in Tehran, which was a slap to, to Hezbollah because Tehran and, and uh, Hezbollah are very, very closely linked. Mm -hmm. So there was a slow increase, pushing, sort of pushing the, the limits. And each time Israel responded by pushing the limit back a little bit, but not really changing the rules of the game. Right. 
Elliot, before we go on, I just want you yes. to paint a picture for our viewers about the north of Israel, because this is not a few rockets, pew, 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 coming in. This is complete destruction. Right. This is 60,000 people no longer living the way they did. Can you comment on that? Well, it's more than that. First of all, 60,000 are officially evacuated. Another nearly 30,000 are voluntarily evacuated. Mm -hmm. And... Many of us are not living, I mean, I, I don't live the way I did. I live with an ear to the siren and keeping close track on where my family is and uh, making sure that the safe room is ready for immediate use, uh, not being able to travel on days when a lot of rockets, and a lot of rockets can be 100, 150 rockets fired into northern Israel in a day. They fired nearly 10,000 rockets since October. That doesn't count drones. It doesn't count anti-tank missiles, which are not part of the count. And here I can say a good deal of the damage along the border is by anti-tank missiles, not the rockets, because they're precise. They're aiming them specifically at buildings and, and destroying them. There are towns like Metula, a, 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 an amazingly beautiful village in the the. Uh, the upper part of the of the, the whole of valley is destroyed. It doesn't exist anymore. It's rubble. Kiryat uh, Shmona heavily damaged. Other kibbutzim moshevim heavily damaged. We don't talk about it because we say, okay, our building was damaged. But if it's your home that was blown to pieces, and this this is what's going. We're talking about thousands and thousands of structures that have been either destroyed or heavily damaged in the course of this past year. We're talking about roads that have been closed, schools that are closed, hospitals that are now operating underground. This is another legacy of the, the Hezbollah threat over the years. Northern hospitals, Tzfat, Nahariya, Rambam, and Haifa, have turned their three-level underground garages into hospitals. And now everybody is being treated from, from uh, inpatient hospitalization to maternity to surgery uh, to emergency rooms are all underground. So this is what we call routine. So basically, this cannot continue. There's no, no way it, the country can live like this. No, no. It, first of all, socially, it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. Economically, it's a disaster, uh, and and security-wise, it's a disaster. We've simply we have allowed Hezbollah to dictate that the northern part of Israel is uninhabitable. Beyond that, the the uh, the far, forests have been burned, nature reserves have been destroyed. Uh, Christians who visited Israel to and been to Caesarea Philippi, Banyas, it doesn't exist anymore. I did not know this. Okay, the ruins are there, but the nature reserve is burned to the ground. The Don nature reserve is burned. Oh, wow. Okay, these are things that are not being reported. And so, I, so this brings us to a threat of an all-out war erupting between Israel and Hamas. And before we Hezbo go, Hezbollah. That, yes, my apologies. And before we get to yes. that, if we think of the war raging between Israel and Hamas in Gaza at the moment, the war between Israel and Hezbollah would have been much worse. Why? Absolutely. Okay. So first of all, Hezbollah is the same scale. It's slightly larger than Hamas in terms of personnel. We're talking about 40,000 terrorists. But terrorists trained and organized as soldiers on a much higher level than Hamas was. Uh, trained by Iran, equipped by Iran, a huge rocket and ballistic missile arsenal that has been estimated at 150,000 at the start of all of this. My estimate was hired in the 300,000 range, but it's, it's not all that, that important. The ability to cause massive destruction in Israel, uh, along with civilian casualties, all the way to Tel Aviv and beyond. In other words, not just along the northern border. 
plus their assault forces, as I mentioned earlier. And, and we know that their plan, they, were, they had tunnels under the border, uh, which we found a few years ago, and nobody I know believes that we found all of them. We found a bunch and destroyed them. Um, it was known to us for quite a number of years that they got tunneling equipment from North Korea. In other words, th this is this is not tunneling. Um, if anybody's seen the movie The Great Escape, on the level of uh, you know being able to crawl through a tunnel, these are tunnels that you can drive trucks through. And and they dug in heavily into South Lebanon, meaning that the uh -huh. the threat of going into Lebanon was enormous as well. They had a very, very well-organized command and control system, uh, hierarchy, etc. And what we started doing over the months is two things. One, gradually the Air Force has been degrading their rocket supply system. Now, not all at once, but a warehouse here, an arsenal there, and so on. Uh, recently, a, a number of video clips have come out from our recent attacks on their, their warehouses, and you can see the buildings, and they're stored in civilian buildings, by the way. Right. Uh, but you can see the building gets hit, and then what are known as secondary explosions going off afterwards, and the, each one of those flashes is another rocket blowing itself up. And you see 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, boom, 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 one after the other from, from what, what we call one target. But in fact, this could be taking out 30, 40, 50 rockets at a time. And that adds up. More significantly, or, or at least as significantly, we've been degrading their command structure over the past number of months. Now, here again, it was one here and one there. Uh, but here, I, I think it's an important thing to, to understand the difference between a terrorist organization and, say, a state and a regular military. And I'm going to use the Israeli military as an example, um, but any professional military, I think, has the same kind of structure. An officer, and I'm talking about a high-ranking officer, let's say a colonel in, in, in the Israeli military, has been selected for his position, and again, let, for, for our purpose of, of discussion, a brigade commander, colonel, was selected to be brigade commander from a number of candidates, all competent colonels, well, lieutenant colonels to be promoted to colonel, any one of whom could do the job, presumably the one who was selected was better than the others, but the other four, five, six, seven were are certainly capable and competent. They've come up through the positions. They've, they've been in command and staff, and, and if they've made it this high, they've gone through selection all the way going up. Meaning, first of all, that if something happens to that colonel, there's another one who could step in and take his place almost immediately. The second thing is that when you're appointed to a position, here again, let's say brigade command, you serve in that position for three years. And then you are moved to another position. You may be promoted. You may be moved to a, a lateral position for career purposes or whatever. I always joke that just as they get really good at the job, they get moved out of it. <laughs> um, and I say that to colonels, and they they agree. Uh, <laughs> but it means that they they are also largely interchangeable because of that. Mm. Okay, they're good, they're competent. And don't get me wrong; this is not in any way meant to denigrate the the qualities and the capabilities. But they it's a it's a quick learning, uh, quick expertise, and then move on to something else. Hassan Nasrallah was the head of Hezbollah for 32 years. Farad Shukr, who we took out a few months ago, and then Ibrahim Akil, who was his deputy, were the number, they were now number one and number two. They were number two and number three to Imad Mornio, who we took out in 2009. These guys were the leaders of the terrorist operation part of Hezbollah since the early 1980s. They were involved, by the way, and were responsible for the blowing up of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, for the Marine barracks in Beirut. We're talking about in the early 1980s. Now, what that means is that they were exceedingly good at what they did. You don't stay in a job for 40 years if you're not good at it. 
but it makes them also somewhat irreplaceable in the immediate sense because you can't replace somebody with 40 years of experience overnight. You can put a new person in there, but you can't create 40 years of experience in a month. So for both of those reasons, the, taking out these individuals has far more impact than the equivalent in a an institutional military. Or for that matter, taking out a, I don't believe that any of these people are political leaders because it's a violent terrorist organization. But here again, let's take it by equivalent. The president or prime minister of a country is immediately replaceable and typically doesn't have that many years experience, exclusive experience, as compared to anybody else. There is nobody to replace Hassan Nasrallah at his level. Now let's add to that what's been going on over the past two weeks. First of all, the pagers and... Before we get into that, we've spoken about the fact that this would be severe on the Israeli community. But what yes. would an all-out war mean for the people of Lebanon, the non-Hezbollah people of Lebanon? First of all, horrific. Um, even, even for the, the Hezbollah families, I mean, I feel bad for them. Their, their homes are being destroyed. As a matter of fact, we've put out over the past few weeks messages. We've made phone calls. I'm talking with the Israeli intelligence. Two people and saying, look, your home is being used as a weapons storage center. You need to leave your home now because we're going to be striking it. Uh, we made it as, as public announcements. If your home is in or near a weapons storage, munition storage center, get out. Get out of that area. We are going to be striking it. So we've kept civilian casualties very low under the circumstances. And Every death is a tragedy. I don't want to make it sound otherwise. Okay. Uh, but but for warfare, we've we've kept it very low, uh, and the the result is many displaced people. We saw the, 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 a similar situation in Gaza. Uh, many people displaced. Many people moving to to different places. Trying you know, if we're here again, if we're talking about the Hezbollah families. These are Shiites. They're moving from one Shiite area to another, which is also a Hezbollah area. So it's kind of from the frying pan to the fire. The rest of the population is being affected somewhat less. I say somewhat because uh, Lebanon is, is sectarian and their towns and villages and neighborhoods tend to be homogeneous. Mm -hmm. uh, I, again, I don't want to overstate it, but they tend to be, in other words, Shiite areas are Shiite and Sunni areas are Sunni and Christian areas are Christian. But there's there's a certain overlap of you know just by by proximity we're we're hitting targets and it's having an effect. Um, if it goes to an all out war, then it gets much worse because quite frankly, um, in an all out war we can't afford to be as cautious mm -hmm. and and think twice as we can at this point where we're still operating on relatively low intensity. If Hezbollah were to start, and we know this is their plan, uh, I don't know if they're capable of doing it anymore, but if, if they were to start firing two or 3,000 rockets a day into Israel, we wouldn't be able to play this game for a month. And I say play this game euphemistically, of course, uh, because not a game at all, but at two or 3,000 rockets a day, it has to end very quickly. Quickly means... You don't stop and say, well, what are the consequences uh, of this? Where today we can say, you know what, there's a weapons storage place. Not everybody's evacuated. Let's give them another day. Let's send them a few more messages. We'll deal with it tomorrow. We have other targets. Uh, when a war is going on, you simply don't have that that luxury. And it is a luxury. So Now, the, when you say weapons storage, we're not talking yes. a handgun or a hand grenade. No, no, we're talking... Cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, rockets, uh, in huge numbers. As I said before, my belief is, is that the total is in the 300,000 range, and they're not being held in 300,000 different locations. And they're being packed. Sorry? This is not by accident. This is their no. strategy. No. As a matter of fact, they have a method. They go to families and rent rooms and attics in their homes. 
And the families do it partly because it's income and partly because it's Hezbollah. You're going to say no? And Hezbollah knows that it has the added benefit of, of covering those munitions with a civilian family that is a win-win. Either they act, and, and here again I have to say Hamas does the exact same thing. Either they act as human shields, meaning that Israel doesn't strike because the civilians are there, or they become human sacrifices, and Hezbollah doesn't care one way or the other. In other words, dead civilians work to their benefit because the international media turns around and says, look at all the people Israel's killing. Elliot, this is demonic. This is demonic. Yes. This is demonic. They are. Which There's... brings us to the past two weeks and the brilliance of this strategy. Yes. So it started with the pagers and was followed by the walkie-talkies. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've read articles saying, well, this was, this was terrorism on Israel's part and using civilian uh, devices as... So wait, let, let, let's, let's clarify something. These were dual-purpose civilian devices because they were being handed out to terrorist leaders. Now, when I say leaders, they go from the top including the Iranian ambassador, which, which raises to, to Lebanon, which raises a kind of interesting question. Why does the Iranian ambassador to Lebanon have a Hezbollah pager? But let's leave that for a moment. Um, but the, they weren't handed out to just anybody. In other words, they weren't handed to rank and file. Mm -hmm. There may have been high-level, mid-level, or even low-level commanders, but commanders, people who needed to be able to get messages the explosive that was put into it, and that's a whole story in and of itself how it was done. There's still a lot of speculation. But the bottom line is that all of these pagers had an explosive uh, charge put in next to the battery and were detonated uh, at the press of a button. They were so small that they could cause very little damage if they weren't either on the person's body or in their hands in front of them, which is why. Uh, the operation started with a message being sent so that people would pick up the pager or have their hand on it or, or have it in front of their faces. Uh, but it tells us something. This is not an explosive that was going to blow up a room or a house. It was going to cause very, very limited specific damage. Now, can I guarantee that no innocent person was affected? I can't guarantee that. But it was very, very specific. It was very, very targeted. Uh, the only people who had these pagers were the ones who had them distributed to them. They were for internal Hezbollah operational messaging. So could there have been an accident or a mistake here or there? For sure. But the people who were hit by them were Hezbollah operatives. And, and I'm talking about on a command level of one type or another. That was followed the next day by the walkie-talkies, and everything I just said about the pagers is one level higher on the walkie-talkies, because these are people who needed to be communicated with directly, uh, so we're talking about mid, mid to high level operatives. The result, the immediate result was, the reports now are thousands of their commanders either killed, maimed, or injured. And that has an enormous short-term effect because even if these their, their injuries are recoverable, they're not recoverable in a week or two. This is treatment, rehab, and that sort of thing. In, in other words, a major segment of their command structure was simply taken out. And along with it, their communications network is taken out. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. That wow. was followed on Friday. By a precision strike against Ibrahim Akil, that fellow I mentioned a few times, who was now the number two of Hezbollah. He had been number three until he took out the number two. Um, and he was meeting, he was also the commander of the Redwan force, that assault force that I talked about earlier. And he was meeting with that com their command echelon preparing an October 7th-style attack against northern Israel. 
And we took out the whole bunch of them in one strike, which if you talk about escalation, had they managed to pull off something, even a fraction of October 7th, we would have been in a massive full-scale war immediately with Lebanon. No, no questions asked. With civilians in Lebanon dying, not because yes. Israel wills it, but because Hezbollah oh, wills it. That's right. They all this talk about Hezbollah doesn't want an escalation was simply nonsense. Hezbollah wanted to escalate, but it wanted to escalate on its terms, and we prevented that from happening. Now these three attacks, one day after the other, we're talking about three days in succession, threw another issue into the works. How good is Israeli intelligence? Where are they getting their information from? How do they know who's where and what's what and where everyone is and what's going on? And the answer to that is Israeli intelligence is very, very good. What happened on October 7th was an anomaly, and there are reasons for it, and it's a discussion in and of itself. It was an, there was an intelligence failure, but that doesn't mean the intelligence system is a failed system. And now we're seeing the continuation of that going on since then. In the course of the week after that, we stepped up attacks in by orders of magnitude against their munitions storage. And we have greatly degraded that as well, as well as taking out along the way other leaders, their two of their key rocket commanders, rocket launch commanders, I'm talking about on the full organization level, a number of the more local ones. Um, there's a long list, but essentially the first three level echelons, the top three levels is a better way to put it, echelons of Hezbollah have been eliminated. And then on Friday, we struck the headquarters and took out Hassan Nasrallah, some of his other deputies, staff, and an Iranian general who also happened to be in the headquarters. Why? Why? Because Hezbollah is part of the Quds force of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Here's now, a little known. Where were where where were these headquarters located? Under civilian apartment buildings in the Dakhya neighborhood of Beirut, hiding out and hiding out. hiding out under civilian buildings, and we struck the the target very specifically. It was, a, it was huge damage. If, if you're going after Hassan Nasrallah and his command staff, you don't do it halfway. Mm -hmm. We dropped over 80 tons of bombs on a very, very small area. They were two stories underground. And caused the utter destruction of the headquarters and the buildings that were on top of it. And here again, you only have two choices. Either let them continue doing what they're doing or stop them. And I here again, I don't say it in any any way as uh, mi minimizing the damage or the destruction that's being done to the neighborhoods, but they are established in and under a civilian neighborhood for precisely this reason. Uh, they're in apartments, in civilian buildings. And as I said, under them, and there's the alternative is to let them do what they're doing, to let them continue to plan what they're planning, or to stop them. And frankly, a country that allows an enemy of this type to continue to plan and operate is a country that's that's prepared to commit suicide. And we're not we're not going to do that. So basically what you're saying, it's them or you. And if you have the choice, it's not you. No, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I've told my university and military students over the years, it's a basic lesson, is that when somebody is holding a loaded gun to your head and says, I'm going to kill you, first of all, believe them. And second, understand that it's actually simplified your decision making. Sorry. Because all, all the stuff that mattered to you before doesn't matter anymore. There's somebody holding a loaded gun to your head. You have only one objective at that moment, and that is to get that gun away from your head. And 
all those other considerations that were very, very important 10 minutes ago are just not important anymore. And that's where we've been. That's where they, they put us. By, I'm, I, as we're speaking, I'm getting reports of rockets being fired mm. into the north. Um, by taking out the multi-tier upper echelon and then Nasrallah, and I don't know if it was planned. It was planned. It's brilliant. I, Frankly, I think it was more just the way it worked out. But essentially what has happened is that there's no succession in the hierarchy. Okay, in other words... Now what? Now what? So the in the short term, they're paralyzed, and we can see it. They're, the rocket fire has dropped significantly where it's been coming. It's been sporadic. Uh, there's no real coordination. Um, they can recover. If we give them the time and the, and, and the space, they will recover. The Iranians are already planning on, on the rebuilding of Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. But in order to make that difficult to impossible, this is where Israel has to step up the pressure. Uh, there's talk of a limited ground operation. I believe that that's in the offing. Um, and airstrikes that continue hitting the precision targets that we've got, keeping, keeping them locked back. Uh, on their heels, I can I can give a uh, a boxing analogy that you know, after you've struck your opponent a number of times, that's not when you step back and say, "Okay, take a breather. We'll you know we'll give you a chance to recover." Uh, a ceasefire now would be the equivalent of saving them by the bell, yeah. and that's something that that would be strategic and tactical folly on the part of Israel if we if we were to do that. Uh, now is really the time to weaken them, and if we weaken them enough with a diverse enough, dispersed enough leadership, we, the world, Lebanon, the UN, might be able to impose some sort of arrangement in Lebanon that we can live with. Right. Uh, I say might, it's possible, I'm not terribly confident, but a strong Hezbollah is not going to agree to it, or greatly weakened one might, if only to give themselves the breathing space to take the next decade to build up again. So for all intents and purposes, within two weeks, Israel dismantled, decapitated enemy number one on your northern border, pushing yes. out or limiting a war so significant in which thousands of civilians in Lebanon would have died, which means that this is not about death. This was Absolutely about not. Life. This, this is about stopping murderers, self-declared murderers. And by the way, it, it's... Um, Hezbollah's reach was into Syria. They supported the Assad regime during the Syrian war. Right. Um, they are cheering mm -hmm. in Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, they're cheering in other countries where Hezbollah's reach ha has been felt. They are brutal. They're not just brutal to Israelis and Jews. They're brutal to everyone they come in contact with. And on brutality on, on a savage level. Uh the the Iranian um, emigres are celebrating because they they realize that that Nasrallah is part of the Iranian system, the Ayatollah system. So, you know, the West isn't looking at it that way, no. um, but those on the ground here, and I say, and not just Israelis, are looking at the possible dismantling, at least in the short term defanging, if you will, of a terrorist organization that has wreaked havoc across the region. Uh, and again, not just to Israel. So basically, the people of Lebanon should be thanking Israel for this. Uh, to a great extent, yes. And I think many of them would if they weren't afraid of Hezbollah coming out and, and massacring them, right. which it has done in the past. Right. Uh, 
Elliot, my last question to you, um, what can we expect? What, what can we in Israel expect? Do you think that Iran will come to the aid of their proxy or will it continue to do what it has for the past few months? Just stand afar off and watch. Okay, with, with all of the danger of predicting, and I always say I don't do prophecy. Um, uh, I, I'm a, a disciple of, of two great political philosophers, one of whom your watchers and listeners will not have heard of is an American baseball star named Yogi Berra. Um, but Winston Churchill, who I'm sure you have heard of, um, who said that it's always best to prophesy about things that have already happened. Um <laughs> But having said that, I will go a bit out on a limb and say that Iran is not going to come to the aid of Hezbollah. It um, it doesn't. It is exposed now. Iran is heavily exposed. Hezbollah was its frontline deterrence against Israel. The fear, the or the idea was that Israel would be afraid to strike Iran because it would trigger a strike, an attack by Hezbollah. And now that's no longer there. And it's important to understand that Hezbollah exists. It was created by Iran, and, and let nobody think otherwise. It is a creation of Iran from the early 1980s, and, and the planning began as soon as Khomeini came into power in 1979 and in early 1980. It had nothing to do with the war in Lebanon in 1982, as many, much of the literature incorrectly states. Mm. And again, there's a whole story of why in, in and of itself. But it was created to be a branch of Iran, a front line of Iran. And here, to use a chess analogy, you don't sacrifice your queen to protect the rook. You sacrifice the rook to protect the queen. The queen is in Tehran. The rook is in Beirut. Elliot, I can speak with you all day. And I'm sure we will speak to you again. Thank you so My much pleasure. for unpacking this with us. Two weeks ago, this region, we braced for yet another war. Today, we look at a terror organization completely decapitated. It seems like a story from the Old Testament with the kings of Israel, right? The hand of God. He who watches over Israel will never slumber nor sleep. This is Ilse Strauss for Bridges for Peace from Jerusalem, wishing you shalom.